Well, what a hearty bunch of people you all are for braving the weather and being here. I'm impressed. Um, I'm Tony Hansen, and I'm the leader of the Technology Special Interest Group, and I, I welcome you all. There is a sign-up slip passing around, so at some point, if you will make sure and either check off your name there, or if you're not on the list, just write your name and your email, list, email address on the page on the back, and I'll make sure that you are. I've made a couple of changes to the agenda for the year in going over the material for tonight and looking at what I was doing for the archiving stuff. I realized I really didn't have enough for four presentations, so I'm going to compress it down into two. So this one's still going to be the first one primarily on organizing your files. I'll give you a couple of months to practice it, and then we'll pick up again in December and talk about the storage methodologies. Um, to fill in the gaps there, then I've lined up a couple of other talks. One is understanding your smartphone. If uh, your phone is smarter than you are, this might be an interesting talk for you. It's certainly the case for me. And then in April, we'll talk a bit about understanding audio, explain some of the, the magic of what I'm doing here, and just kind of help understand how perhaps you can use things like your smartphone and other audio recording devices and things to kind of expand your toolkit of what you can do as a genealogist and how you can record people's stories. So stay tuned for that. Just want to rem make a reminder that we do have a general meeting coming up on Saturday, um, just this coming Saturday down on the first floor of the, of the auditorium, in the auditorium on the first floor here. And we're going to have um, a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Gatewood, who is a, a well-known author, written quite a few books, and he'll be talking about a new one, Bonnie and Clyde's Baby Daughter, which he guarantees me there is some genealogy in there. There's actually a family tree, I believe, for Bonnie and Clyde both in the book. And uh, Jim agreed to stand in at the very last minute. Uh, Connie Gray, who was going to be speaking to us on Saturday, her son is seriously ill, and so she had to cancel pretty much at the last minute. And Jim was very gracious to be able to step in and fill in for us. So. I'm very grateful to, for him, to him since I'm the one responsible for the speakers this year. So, but we're here tonight to talk about archiving. And as I said, we're going to break this archiving stuff up into a couple of pieces. And tonight, we're primarily going to be talking about how you can organize your files. And I just wanted to mention that I'm going to talk about a lot of uh, resources, a lot of places, a lot of software packages, and all of these things are listed on this website. So if you go to dallasgenealogy.org slash PDA, You'll find a, a web page, all of the links that I'm going to mention here. And if you want to flip along tonight, I've got a, a PDF version of this presentation to you, or you can just follow along on the screen there. Get these side ones up. If you're like me, you've probably got a lot of digital files. I, I looked this morning on my system, and I've got 4,653 genealogy files. They're in 254 folders and occupy a bit better than 21 gigabytes worth of disk storage. So I have a lot of stuff, and I'm very nervous about it. Because I'm very concerned about what's going to happen to those files when my name stops looking like this and starts looking a bit more like that. Now, you're all genealogists. You know what that means. So I'm very concerned about having these files in a place and in a format that perhaps they will outlive me and be more useful than I'm going to be in some distant point in the future. And so that's the purpose of this talk tonight, is to help you begin to get an understanding of the things that you can do, um, not just to help your legacy, not to make sure that your files, I mean, not just to make sure that your files are going to be available to researchers in the future, but you're going to find that these things that I'm talking about are going to make them a lot more useful to you in the here and the now. Uh, the things that I'm going to talk about are going to make it a lot easier for you to manage your files and to locate them and uh, I think you're going to agree that it's going to be a lot of work. I'm not going to minimize that, but if, if you go through the work and do this, that the, the, the payoff and the benefit is going to be huge. So I'm talking about doing something that fits in the broad general category of personal digital archiving. So it's personal because unless you happen to be famous, wealthy, or a former president of the United States, I'm looking at the person that's going to be doing the work here. It's going to be up to you to do these things to organize your files, to preserve them, and to make them in such a state that they're going to be um, viable far into the future. Because unless you've got you know, a couple hundred billion dollars in your own little entourage, you're not going to have any historians or archivists following along after you to do it, I don't suspect. At least I know that's going to be the case for me. By digital files, we're talking about things that are in a digital format. So we're talking about images that you've maybe scanned or downloaded from FamilySearch or Ancestry.com or pictures you've taken with your digital camera or scanned, documents that you've created. Uh, genealogists are using things like PowerPoint and you know, words, um, word processors and spreadsheets and all kinds of stuff to create files to help tell our family's stories. And those are all things that we ought to be concerned about preserving. 
even things like videos, audio files, email, and let's not forget what's going on up in social media. So all of these things are things that we ought to be concerned about if there is stuff in them that we want to preserve for the future. Now because of the, the scope of what I'm talking about, I'm going to limit my talk primarily to images and to pictures and to documents. What I have to say generally applies to the videos and audio files and email and, and social media, but not specifically. Those are kind of a, a category of and all by themselves and perhaps would be a, a future presentation. But again, as far as managing the files and doing some of the things that we talk about, it really applies to any kind of a file that you might uh, come across or might have on your computer. So we know the people that are going to be doing the work. We know we're talking about digital files. What do we mean by archiving? Well, archiving is a process that involves storing digital records. And those records hopefully are going to have some descriptive information using appropriate file formats stored in multiple locations for a very long time. And it's truly a process because, as you'll see when we talk in December, you're going to have to come back and do some maintenance. You can't just write this stuff, put it in a shoebox, and forget about it. Periodically, it is necessary to go back and to do some things to make sure that the files are still readable. Perhaps even to modify the formats of the files. Um, ever hear of a little company called uh, Microsoft and software upgrades and things like that? So if you have uh, things that you care about in files, if the standard for that file changes, if companies like Microsoft come out with new versions and new versions and new versions and new versions, it's not going to be very long before your files are not readable anymore. So the maintenance part of this is also a very important component of it and something we're going to spend a lot of time talking about in December. So that's just kind of a, a pitch for what's, what's happening coming up. I've studied this quite a bit and I've identified what I believe are eight elements of a successful archiving strategy. And tonight we're going to focus on the first three. And those are having a useful directory structure, using descriptive file names, and then using something called metadata. And then, as I said in the December presentation, we'll talk about the remaining things, which are making sure you're using appropriate file formats for the files that you're creating and storing, writing on archival quality media, having many copies, multiple locations, and then the maintenance and the migration stuff that I talked about. But again, that's for December. We've got enough to talk about just with those first three things tonight. So let's begin with the directory structures. You know, any computer, whether it's a, a Windows or a Macintosh or a Unix or your own operating system, you're going to have some kind of an inherent way that you can organize your files and create directories and store stuff. And so you can take advantage of that and create a directory structure that makes, that just makes sense. So you, know, you want to create something, some way of organizing your files that's meaningful to you because, you know, you're the primary beneficiary. As I said, uh, what I have found as I have gone through all these things is having these files organized has made them incredibly easily discoverable by me. So when I'm looking for stuff, it's much simpler for me to find it. It's a lot easier for me to manage it. So, you know, that's the first beneficiary is you. But again, we're also talking about archiving the stuff for somebody that may come along a bit after you, shall we say. And so you want to make sure that, you know, you, you kind of spell things out, use whole words, and organize it in a way that's going to be kind of intuitive and logical to somebody who might look at it if, let's just say, if you're not there to help explain it. And in all the literature I read, everybody agrees on how important this is. But nobody agrees on how to do it. So there are as many you know, suggestions on how to do it as there are you know, books and articles and things that I've read. And here's one more, mine. And actually, I, did, uh, I saw Nancy Lowe speak at RootsTech a couple of years ago and was really impressed by a lot of what she had to say. And she's also put out this small little EPUB. Uh, her, her guide to organizing genealogical research using archi archival principles. Now, unlike me, she actually is a, a real archivist, and she has a lot of really good information in this book. You can order it in a um, PDF format, and if you use the, the discount uh, code Jane's Help, she'll give you a 10% discount on anything that she orders. So for $8.09, you can have this incredibly you know, helpful book. And I feel compelled to plug her because I, I blatantly stole most of what she said on the next slide here, so I'm going to give her credit for it. But the idea is this, you know, you create one kind of master directory, call it something clever like genealogy or family history or my family or whatever, and then create some subfolders within that master folder and put all of your genealogy stuff in there. And so we'll talk about what uh, kinds of things you can put in each of these folders. So an administrative folder, as the name implies, you kind of put the things that are associated with the administrative aspects of being a genealogist. So if you have you know, electronic references, if you're keeping correspondence with somebody, if you've got forms, information about societies, research trips, to-do lists, if you're a professional, you might have clients. All of that kind of information can have a home in the administrative folder and an appropriate folder and a logical place to put it. 
This is one I added to what Nancy had suggested. I've got a lot of correspondence from the relatives that, I'm re that I research, and so I just wanted to have a place where I could put the letters and the things, so I created a correspondence directory. If you're using a local software package, some kind of you know, family tree maker or something like that, and you have local files on your PC that you need to have someplace, make a directory in here and put them in that. Another one that I added to Nancy's suggestion was something called locations, because I'm, again, I found that I had a lot of maps and other kinds of information about the places that I'm researching and the places where my ancestors lived, and I wanted to have uh, you know, a logical, organized place to put them. So for example, if you would go into my Norway directory and then look at my reference materials, you know, you'd find that I've got some spreadsheets. Uh, in, in Norwegian research, farms are incredibly important, uh, because when you have names like, you know, um, Cyber Halverson and Halver Cyberson, you know, where the names are the same, what the Norwegians do is they, at least they used to, we kind of pick up the farm name. So it'd be Cyber Halverson that lived in Honda, which is different than Cyber Halverson that lived on, you know, some other farm. So farms are incredibly important, and, and one of the things, you know, that I've done is just I've got a spreadsheet here that I've worked out trying to help identify, you know, who's who, what farm, and, and that kind of stuff. But the whole point is this, this one directory contains my reference material for Norway, and if I'm looking for anything, it's really easy for me to know where to go find it and to be able to find it very quickly. So it's just an example of how this organization can really help you keep your files in a, in a better organized manner than just having them scattered with, in one big directory. I also have a lot of pictures, and in particular within pictures, I've got categories of things. So just one tip I'll pass on. I know this works on Windows. I don't know if it works on a Macintosh. But if you begin a name with an underbar like this, it will automatically, if you're sorting the stuff alphabetically, put those up at the very top of the list. And so I've created some categories like cemeteries and locations and ships in addition to some specific surnames. And this is how I have my pictures organized. Now cemeteries bear a lot of particular discussion, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. Because I don't know about you, but when I go back and look at pictures of cemeteries, they all kind of look the same. <laughs> Maybe you found that. And so I've gone through a lot of work to try to organize my cemetery pictures to make them make a little bit more sense to me. So again, this is all just kind of, you know, this is the way Tony does it, take it with a grain of salt. But when I take a bunch of pictures, I take and import them into a pictures directory, and I leave them there. So I've got you know, like all of my pictures in one big thing. But then when it comes to stuff like cemetery pictures, I go and I carve out all the pictures that I took at a particular cemetery, bring them over here, and put them into an appropriately named file. Now we'll talk about naming conventions in a minute. But by doing this, it's real easy, for example, to see that those are the four times that I've gone to the Calvary Cemetery and taken pictures. And I know that because of the way I've named the file, even including the date that I was there. And so within any one of these directories here, it is all of the pictures that I have taken at that cemetery on that day. So if I'm going back to look, you know, if I, you know, I know who's in the Calvary and I want to go back and look through the pictures that I've ever taken there, it's really easy to get back there and see the collection of pictures that I took at that cemetery. Now this isn't exactly archiving, but I'll throw in a few bonus tips too. Another thing I try to make a habit of doing when I'm taking pictures at a cemetery is the very first picture I take when I'm there is something telling me what cemetery I'm in. And then I try to do the same thing as, as I leave. Now this one's kind of clever because I could take it from the back of it. They're not all like that. <laughs> but you know, all of the pictures that appeared in between that first picture and the last picture were at, the, at this particular cemetery up in Wisconsin. So that just makes it a whole lot easier months or years later when I'm going through all this endless streams of pictures to at least know where the pictures in the cemetery started and where they ended. I think you can leave a tip at the door if you like that. We have a directory for primary sources then. And so you can organize all of your materials that you have, you know, by baptisms or birth or burial or census. And what I like about this is that since I've got them all in one place, instead of, now a lot of people I know like to you know, take their census records and, you know, here's the Hansen census and here's the Jones census. This way, at least, it's real easy for me to look and see what I have and what I'm missing and if I have duplicates. And so and that's one of the benefits that I found in doing this is it's really helped me get my stuff better organized and recognize when I'm, I'm missing some records. So again, you can just, you know, if you come up with another primary source I don't think of, just make your own directory in there and put them in there. All right, it's quiz time. Why well, not yet? Okay, so, all right, so this is just an example again of how if you go and click into my primary sources and go and look at land records, you know, again, we haven't talked about names, but we're about to, but it does give you a pretty good idea of how I do stuff. By looking just at the name of these files, I've got a pretty good idea of who's involved, where, when, and what it is we're talking about. And again, by having them organized with all of the same types of records in one directory, 
it just makes it incredibly convenient for managing them. All right, now here's a quiz. Is DNA a primary source or a secondary source? I hear primary. I hear secondary. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I stuck it in secondary because I wasn't sure, but I'm, I, that, I really would like a definitive answer on that. I, I don't really know what, what DNA is. But anyway. Okay. So, uh, um, so a, a, a reference standard and, or a standard for referring to DNA materials is what they're developing, or? Yeah, I think it's good. And, you know, it's going to be ethics and other things, but I'm sure part of it is going to be whether it's primary. I've got a I'm not, uh, draft version of that. I've got it correct. We're going to, uh, I look forward to solving that mystery and seeing what it is. And then the last one is just a surname directory. So if you haven't found a home for something that you have associated with the person in any of the other previous directories, then this is kind of the, the directory of last resort, and that's where I dump stuff. So for example, again, if you go look in the Amborn directory now, another habit that I've gotten into is in naming the directories. Um, I name it for the person, and I include the birth date and the death date. And so that way, when I'm looking at these directories, there's no doubt at all about exactly who I'm talking about. Now, for those of you that are not lucky enough to have Scandinavian ancestors, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you get a situation, OK, so you know, who, where they're born, and when they died. If you get a situation like this, you know, where, where you've got Cyber Halverson, and I've also got um, Halver Cyberson three times as well. Because in, in, in the Scandinavia, you'd be Cyver Halverson, then you'd be Halver Cyverson, and then it just kind of goes on down like a crazy puzzle. And so, you know, I found it very handy to do this because now I know that this is the Cyver Halverson that was born in 1858 as opposed to the one that was born in 1793, which is entirely different than the one born in 1731. So that kind of helps me uh, keep them all straight. And then within that directory, then it's just, you know, documents, pictures, or not pictures, but things related to him. The other thing that I found handy as well in naming directories for my Scandinavian people is to just kind of do this Halver underbar because it can be Halver S-O-N, S-E-N, S-S-O-N, S-S-E-N, and then let's not forget the daughter. So, you know, all of these things can be referring to a child of the same person or not the same person. It kind of depends on which person you're talking about. You know, so it just kind of helps me keep my sanity, you know, knowing this is, you know, Halver whatever. And so you can see I've got, you know, uh, I've got Anton son, Anton daughter, Halverson, Halver daughter, the Lawrence Zins, whatever. So these directories are my Scandinavian people, and I know that there can be a variety of surnames in there. And again, these are just things I'm kind of pointing out to you that this is how I've modified this to work for me, which is what you need to do too. As you're developing your system and coming up with your methodology, you know, you don't have to say, oh, Tony didn't say I could do this. It's not in Nancy's book. Feel free to modify this in any way to make sense for what you need and uh, to kind of fit your family. Okay, so that's kind of it on directory structure. I think you get the idea there is just create, you know, appropriate directory names and use them and, and keep your files organized. Moving on then to descriptive file names, I've, I've kind of alluded to this already, but in my opinion, a file name ought to at least suggest who, what, when, and where. And if you can get that just out of the, the name of the file without having to open it and look at it and see what's in it, you're so much further ahead. So, you know, so for example, you know, this is the scheme that I try to use where I, I start with the name. I start with the last name, first and middle name. I include some kind of a keyword describing what is the document. So this is obviously some kind of a birth record. Uh, it's from 1899 in a town called Rakestad in the country of Norway. So just simply by looking at this file name, I know what it is. So I don't have to even... And we'll get to metadata, which is another way that you can as well. But you know, if I'm having you know, good descriptive file names like this with, with good descriptive directory structure, it really goes a long way towards helping me quickly be able to locate files, know what I have, and know what I'm missing, and know when I have duplicates. This last field there, I try to use what you know, real archivists would call a controlled vocabulary. And so I use terms like birth, or marriage, or death certificate, or census, or genealogy form, draft registration, you know, deed, just try to use consistent terms so that these things have some meaning 
and I don't have you know four different variations on birth records and 15 different ways of spelling marriage. So again, there's no hard and fast rule or way that you have to do this, but the more consistent and concise you can make it, the better off it's going to be for, for you. So, you know, real archivists will tell you that you should use the name as it appears on the document. So, you know, misspellings, warts and all. Luckily, I'm not a real archivist, so I don't do that. Um, and, and I do this for a reason. I try to keep, you know, for this way it's easy for me to tell that I have, you know, all of, you know, a particular ancestor's records, regardless of the 20 different ways that they, they spell the name. And I'm able to sleep at night because of metadata. And I'll show you in the next section when we go into metadata how you can put the variations in the names and embed it in the metadata associated with the file and, and accomplish what the archivists are trying to do as well. So again, that's just a direction that I've chosen to go. It, it makes my wife angry. It makes professionals angry, but I don't care. It works for me. So here's an example of how this did help me out. As I was going through and sorting all this stuff, I came across this, a bunch of census records. And you notice that I've got, you know, Anton, just A-N-T-O-N, I've got Anton with an E, I've got Anton H, Anton Heinrich. Well, as it turned out, these were all records associated with the same person. And until I got all of these things together and looked at them all together, I didn't realize that. And so part of what I did is I was getting my files into this, into this mode of organization. I went through and I cleaned some of the stuff up and just got, you know, I picked one way of return, referring to Anton H. Amborn, and I now know that I've got every census record from 1860 through 1930, including a couple of state censuses in the odd years. So having consistent file names, consistently using the same way of referring to the person and the way that I'm referring to the document, it makes it you know, very easy for me to tell the records that I have and the records that I don't have at a glance. Now I just, you know, I probably should have said, you know, federal census. And then by the time I got around to realizing I should have it and bumped into these state things, I thought, well, okay, if it doesn't say federal, it's federal. If it's state, I'll say that. Um, again, there's no wrong way of doing this, no right way of doing this, but consistency is really important. So when you pick a way, it's just important that you try to stay with it and stay consistent with it as you, as you go through and do this for all of your files. And I probably got this on a slide somewhere. Really, the only wrong thing you can do here is don't do it. I mean, this is this is incredibly helpful now going to be incredibly useful as you, as you get on to the archiving piece of it. Actually, this is a component of archiving. It's, as, as I've said, archiving is really about eight different steps. So this is just one of the things that you get to do. So as I said, you should try to describe in the file name who, what, when, and where. And you want to be consistent. So if you pick you know, a format, whatever order you choose to do it, try to stick with that then in all of the, the other files that you name that way. And try to avoid abbreviations. You know, spell things like saint and mount and township and county all the way out. Uh, for one thing, it helps avoid some inconsistencies. I don't always ab abbreviate things the same way. Sometimes I put sta spaces, sometimes I put, you know, underbars and things. This just eliminates all of that. It's also very useful for people who are looking at your files that are maybe not really familiar with English. If you spell all this stuff out, it's a lot easier for them to look at, at what you're doing and, and what you've typed and make sense out of it. Okay, so that's as much as you can do kind of on the surface, doing the things that you can see in the directory structures and in the file names. But there's a whole other layer of, of, of a tool, of a component that you have at your disposal that can really, really, really help you organize your files. And that something is called metadata. So, so how many of you just, I'm going to see a show How many think you feel comfortable knowing what metadata is and how to work with it? Okay, I'm about four or five out of about the 20 or so that are here. Okay, well, good. Then hopefully this won't be too boring for those of you that know. And if you see something I said wrong, just, all right, tell me. I guess I want to know it. So if you see it, let me know. <laughs> Metadata, though, is just simply data about data or information about information. Now, it can be embedded directly with the file or it can be associated with the file. But either way, it's just information about something. In the pre-digital age, we did metadata and pictures by you know, writing the, or actually the date got printed when they processed the film. And if you're lucky, somebody wrote something on the front or on the back of the, of the picture. And that's a simple example of, of metadata. That's information about this, this picture. I know that it was printed in August 1961, and that was the Hanson Evans Tolley family. Well, fam, ran out of room. But that's a very simple example of what metadata is. Metadata, and it's, you know, on, on the surface, is really kind of simple. It's just information about things. Now you can have something called external metadata, at least I call it that. 
And that's descriptive information that you can maintain in a document or a spreadsheet or a database. So, you know, Gene's going to pass around a, a book that he's rightfully very proud of. It's, it's a catalog of a bunch of, well, all of the pictures of a certain time frame. And what he could choose to do th with that is have another document that says, okay, you know, here's the information about this picture. There's the information about that picture and maintain it maybe in a spreadsheet. That would be an example of an external metadata set, but it's not directly associated with the image. It's not directly associated with the document. And so the problem with that is it's kind of easy for the two to get lost. So, you know, it only has, the metadata only has some kind of a logical or a tenuous association with the image or the thing that you're describing. And so as a result, you know, you may see this in large corporate or university settings where they've got big staffs of people and redundant systems and, you know, all kinds of stuff to maintain this stuff. So like if you go to the portal to Texas History, you know, that's how they do their metadata. They've got their stuff all off in a database someplace that's associated with the image and they just hope that they never have a power outage like I had at home this afternoon and have it all go down the drain. That's not what we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay, so I just want to mention this does exist. Uh, my wife and I, we, we had a, a really interesting month where we were arguing about metadata before we finally figured out she was thinking this and I was thinking about what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So I just, in case, I'm sure she's not here tonight, but <laughs> anybody is as knowledgeable and bright as her, we're not talking about this stuff, okay? <laughs> we're talking about something that is embedded with and associated with the actual image. So when you have an image file that you've created maybe with a camera or that you've created with a scanner or downloaded from like Ancestry, First of all, the image itself, all of the pixels, the things that actually describe the image are going to be contained in some part of the file and they're going to be arranged in a way that's dictated by the file format that they're saved in. So TIFF has a certain way of arranging the stuff that describes the image. JPEG is different. Ping is completely different. BMP is, you know, crazy. So there's all these different file formats that describe how all of the, the pixels are digitized and stored and, and written into and compressed or not compressed that have nothing to do with, might have everything to do with the image. And that's all that it really has to do with. Within that same file, you can associate other information. So if it's a photograph, there is more information that is associated with it, usually using a standard call, called EXIF. It's an exchange image file format. And it is a, a standard that was put together by the photographic industry, primarily driven, I believe, by some companies in Japan. And Susan will probably know this better than I do. But Okay, but anyway, it, it, it just it describes some information about the picture, and I'll show you an example of that. But the point is, is that information, like particularly when you're using a digital camera, the camera just automatically records the date, the time, information about the exposure, and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it just writes it into the file right with the image, and the two are just always together. So that's one example of a form of metadata right there. So your digital camera will create that for you. It comes free of charge. You don't have to do anything. Where the work comes in, though, is in another piece of the file, which many file formats support, um, that allow you to put additional information, additional metadata. And this is stuff that you can just type in and associate with the file. And again, there's a variety of, of choices you have for what type of metadata, what, you know, how this information is formatted and stored in the file. The, the most widely accepted one is something known as the International Press Telecommunications Council standard. Now, if you think about it, the people in running newspapers have been involved in dealing with images a long time. You know, I can remember as a kid, my dad was a reporter back in the 60s, and, you know, they actually used to actually have a thing where they put pictures on the wire, wire service pictures. Remember those? And so it was a, a revolving drum, kind of a precursor to a scanner, and they'd, they'd put the picture on there, and it would digitize it, and it would transmit it to where they were trying to send the picture, and along with it would go information about that picture. Who was the photographer? Where was it taken? What's the subject? You know, all that stuff that you would see, you know, in the newspaper the next day across the country. And that standard has been refined over the years and has evolved into what is used today in digital files as the way of formatting and saving metadata information in text files. So there's a lot of ways that you can create metadata and associate it with an image, but whatever you use, whichever software package you choose, I would urge you to make sure that it supports the IPTC standard because that is the one that is most widely recognized and will give you the most um, compatibility as you move these images around. But again, the purpose of this image is just to show that the, the image data, the camera information, and the metadata that you may choose to associate with it are all contained within the file 
that contains the image. It's all just one big happy unit. And it travels around and stays together for the most part. I'll, at the end, we'll talk about the exceptions to that. So again, the image data, the stuff that starts it all out, is the, the raw uh, digital information, the pixels that came from the camera, the scanner, and saved in a particular format. Now, the format may involve compression, something that makes the, the file smaller and easier to move around or not. Um, and the different types of files you have to choose from, you know, ping and JPEG and TIFF and, and all the other ones, all have different strengths and weaknesses in terms of um, how well they preserve colors, whether they preserve all of the data, whether they lose data, whether it's lossless or lossy. We're not going to talk about that stuff tonight. That is, uh, uh, so we've got something scheduled later on in the year to talk about understanding digital images. But there's a whole bunch of stuff going on up there, but we're just kind of tangentially in interested in it because we want to get to the fun stuff. The EXIF information, again, this is the stuff that uh, is recorded by the camera. So if your camera is capable of recording it, it may record the date and the time. The exposure information, if your camera has GPS capability, it will even include the longitude and latitude. And again, a bunch of stuff that just happens when you push the, the shutter. You don't have to do anything or pay anything to have that information associated with your pictures. And so here's an example of looking at some of that EXIF information from a picture that I took at the State Fair. So in the camera data, it remembers that the camera, or notes the fact that the camera is made by Apple. It was my iPhone 4S. The image size is 2448 by 3264 pixels. It's, I, it was a density of 72 dots per inch. No flash. Here's what my lens was doing, the exposure, um, and even the GPS information. So standing at the, the base of big text, holding the camera right about here, it was 132 meters above sea level. Really useful information. But again, this is all recorded by the camera. I mentioned that uh, the IPTC is kind of the de facto standard. Um, as, a, as an organization, they were created back in 1965 when a bunch of the news services got, to better, got together and, and formed a standard. Uh, since then, they've been focused on developing and publishing standards and getting people to adopt them or adapt. And as I said, this is probably the most widely recognized metadata standard out there and the one that I would encourage you to make sure that your particular software fully supports. Now, metadata, in particular IPTC data, can be associated with a wide range of types of files. So if you have a, a ping or a JPEG or a TIFF file, you will be able to associate IPTC metadata with it. Not so much for things like BMP and GIF. Those file formats do not, do not support this style of metadata, so you cannot associate it with them. And that kind of comes in, I, I ran into this very frustratingly, as trying to save some metadata on a bunch of files, and it would not save. And I was just going crazy, and then I realized I was trying to save it to one of these file types in the group that I had selected, and it, and it wouldn't. So that's why it's important to know that there are some types of files that you cannot save uh, metadata with. So here's an example, again, looking at the metadata using one of the software packages. Um, this is Photoshop. So it does a nice job, and we'll look at this in more detail later, but they have several different tabs to organize the information. So for this photo, there's an IPTC tab, and you can see that there's a field for the creator, the creator's job title, my address, city, state, postal code, country, phone numbers, emails, websites. I mean, they've just thought of a bunch of fields. But the ones they forgot, they put in the IPTC extension, so there's more there. So you can list who's the person shown. You can specify a sublocation. Um, you know, city, province, state again. This is, I guess, where the, uh, the image was created. So there's a lot of flexibility. And as you can see, there's a bunch of other tabs we haven't clicked yet. So, you know, metadata is something that you can't see just by looking at the file. You have to have something that allows you to kind of peer inside the file to see it. And once you do, there's just a whole other world in there. There's just potential for a lot of really interesting information to be recorded and associated with your files.